The way to live is with vulnerability. Necessary. The willingness to say I love you first. The willingness to do something where there are no guarantees. The willing to invest in a relationship that may or may not work out. They thought this was fundamental. I personally thought it was betrayal. Um, I could not believe I had pledged allegiance to research, where our job, you know, the definition of research is to control, control and predict, to study phenomenon for the, reason, for the ex explicit reason to control and predict. And now my very, you know, my mission to control and predict had turned up the answer that the way to live is with vulnerability. And to stop controlling and predicting warmth of our everyday greetings as one of the wonders of this world. Now those wonders run even deeper because when you really connect with another person, uh, a beautifully choreographed biological dance is unfolding um, as your smiles, gestures, and postures come to mirror one another and come into sync. But when you're really connecting with somebody else, your, um, your heart rhythms come into sync. Your biochemistries come into sync. Even your neural firings come into sync. It's as if in that micro moment, a single positive emotion is rolling across two brains and bodies at once, creating a momentary resonance of good feeling and goodwill between you. It provides powerful nourishment for your growth and your health. My data drew me to rethink love from the ground up. My latest data were telling me that the positivity that you feel when you're connecting with others nourishes you more than any other source of positivity. Now, what's more is that as you have more of these micro moments of connection in your daily life, it changes you. It, it changes you for the better, not just socially and psychologically, but also physically. And these discoveries suggest that these connections are biological imperatives. Uh, they give you life. That love is more than flowers and chocolates. That love is, in fact, a life-sustaining, physiological thing that happens in our brain. In, in the broadest of strokes, explain what that, what that thesis is all about. Well, uh, as science has learned more about the brain, we know that love is not just a feeling, or it's not just chocolates, as you're saying, that it's actually a connection between two living brains and a connection of some considerable power over the mind and the body. And we know that across this connection that people establish, they can send information back and forth, they can regulate each other's bodily rhythms across that link, and they can even change the structure of each other's brains across that link. And that totality is what love is. Yeah. Reptiles give birth to eggs, which don't need any care. But mammals give birth to live, helpless animals that need quite sophisticated care if they're going to survive. So that a parent mammal has to be able to discern if the infant is hungry or tired or cold or thirsty or what it needs and provide for those specific needs or the, or the infant will die. So mammals of all parts of their brains that are oriented specifically towards sensing signals that come from another mammal, interpreting them, and feeling disposed to care for the needs that are sensed there. So this is more than simple emotion. This is more than a happiness or sadness. This is a part of us that is hardwired to understand what, how the other person is feeling. and We get a direct sensory experience, actually, of the insides of another person's brain, which is quite remarkable if you think about it. But if you and I knew each other well, I could sense what's going on in your brain. We are designed as a very social species. We're designed to connect. Did you know that FaceTime, time in the physical presence of our loved ones, actually puts the brakes on our stress response? Did you know that our ancestors spent all day, every day, in the company of their loved ones, their friends? Now, whenever we hear the term chemical imbalance, most of us, I think, reflexively assume medication must be the answer. And yet the relevant neuroscience leads us to a somewhat different conclusion. There are many different ways of changing neurochemistry. Most of them have nothing to do with medication. That's why I believe in the long run, the most effective way of balancing neurochemistry is to balance our lives. Remember, experience changes the brain. Thank you.
Whenever you have an experience, you devote more of your brain to processing that. Find out who died. Okay, so the bad news first. <laughs> For every major stressful life experience, like financial difficulties or family crisis, that increased the risk of dying by 30%. But, and I hope you are expecting a but by now, but that wasn't true for everyone. People who spent time caring for others showed absolutely no stress-related increase in dying, zero. Caring created resilience. And so we see once again that the harmful effects of stress on your health are not inevitable. How you think and how you act can transform your experience of stress. When you choose to view your stress response as helpful, you create the biology of courage. And when you choose to connect with others under stress, you can create resilience. And if yeah. you don't know, now you know.